Thank you for cruising by for my daily devotions. April 24th, it's Wednesday, 2024. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, John 6, Psalm 111, and 1 Samuel chapter 27 today. Uh, yesterday we read the second chapter of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, talking about wisdom, verse, verse 6, and a few verses after that. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. This is not worldly wisdom, okay? This is not stuff generated by people, okay? It's different. Verse 7, no, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. As it is written, however, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. What's he talking about, the secret? The secret really comes down to this, that God extends grace to a lost and dying world based on what Jesus paid at the cross. And that's the secret that was hidden. Now it's revealed. You know, it's a wonderful thing. Wisdom is always from the Spirit when people surrender to Christ based on his grace and what he extended them by dying in their place on the cross and being raised from the dead to thump death forever and for good. It always goes back to that. And it's, it's not worldly wisdom. It's godly wisdom. We need to hang on to that. Now, let's take a minute and pray. And I want you to pray for uh, my friend. We, I put out a prayer video for him, kind of an emergency prayer video, Will Taylor. He's my son's father-in-law, and I'm good friends with him. A great guy, about my age, just turned 75. He has a serious stomach problem and um, uh, has to do with a hiatal hernia that's way too big, and it needs to be repaired, and it's very, very dangerous. So I uh, still it was in the hospital last night. They may send him home, but they got to figure out how to handle it, and uh, it's very, very dangerous. So I'm going to pray for, for my dear friend, Will Taylor, and um, that God would bring grace and healing to him, uh, along with along with this the other stuff that we're going to hear from God today. Father, speak to us, make us different because we heard from you, and I pray that you bring grace and healing to Will. I pray that they would come up with the right medical solution, and that he would survive it and do well and flourish and be restored to health. Father, bless him and protect him, and bless his 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 kids, especially Shelley. She married to my son, you know, Father. I pray that you protect them and bless them, protect my grandkids and the whole family in this whole situation. Bring grace and healing to Will Taylor, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Brothers, I do not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, Apollos, are you not mere men? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, only God who makes them grow. Boy, that's a big message, folks. Big message. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes them grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each one will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. God's field and building is the church. That's that's how important the church is, much more important than people view it today, believe me. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that is other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and his, his a relationship with him. He, the Lord, is the foundation of everything. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring to light. It will be revealed with fire and fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. 
If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. Who, he's, he's talking to the church, the people of God. You are the temple. The people are the temple. Okay, They don't go into the temple. They are the temple. The temple go into the auditorium or into the building, but the temple is the people. Hang on to that. That's, that's a big old deal. Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours, and you are you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. It's all about the Lord. It's all about the Lord. John chapter 6. Oh, this is a great chapter. John chapter 6. <clears throat> when I have a drink of coffee, John chapter, chapter 6, 60 verses, I believe, in John chapter 6. But it's a great chapter. Sometime after this, <clears throat> Jesus crossed to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these, for all the, for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages could not buy enough bread to give each one a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter, to Simon Peter's brother spoke up, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. <clears throat> Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same for the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled the 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. <clears throat> when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew, grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat walking on the water and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. When they were waiting, then they were wait, willing to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. The next day, the crowd ha that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with the disciples, but that they had gone aw away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw a miraculous sign, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food <clears throat> that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this. This, this is big, okay, to believe in the one he has sent. In other words, to have put your faith in Jesus. That's the work of God. 
So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. It is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. <clears throat> For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. You know what that meant? That meant he was going to die on a cross for our sin and take our sin, which he'd never touched, and die to pay for it and then be raised from the dead. That's what it meant. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I shall raise him up at the last day. <clears throat> at this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread that came down from heaven. They, they said, it is, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can, we, how can he now say, I came down from heaven? Because he did. God was really his father. That's why. Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one who has seen the Father, no one has seen the Father except the Son, except the one who, has, who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us this his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. My flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna in, and died. And he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He who he said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Actually, it has almost 70, 71 verses. Long chapter, you know, but that's okay. It's a good chapter. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, to them does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He met Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. And then Psalm 111. Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They, they are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. 
He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained the covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good stand, understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. 1 Samuel chapter 27. 1 Samuel 27. I think there's 31 chapters in 1 Samuel. If not, there should be. 1 Samuel, yep, I was right. 1 Samuel 27. David is among the Philistines. But David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me everywhere in Israel, and I will sip, slip out of his hands. So David and the 600 men who, um, with him left and went to Achish, son of Maok, king of Gath. David and his men settled in Gath with Achish. Each man had his family with him, and David had his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of, of Carmel, the widow of Nabal. When Saul was told that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. Then David said to Achish, I, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be assigned to me in one of the country towns that I may live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city with you? So on that day, Achish gave him Ziklag, and it belonged to the kings of Judah ever since. David lived in Philistine territory a year and four months. Now David and his men went up and raided the Geshurites, the Gerzites, uh, and the Amalekites. From ancient times, these people had lived in the land extending to Shur and Egypt. Whenever David attacked an area, he did not leave a man or woman alive, but took sheep and cattle, donkeys and camels, clothes, and then he returned to Achish. When Achish asked, asked, where did you raiding, where did you go raiding today? David would say, against the Negev of Judah, or against the Negev of Jer Jeremiel, or against the Negev the, of the Kenites. He did not leave a man or woman alive to be brought to Gath, for he thought they might inform on us and say, this is what David did. And such was his practice as long as he lived in the Philistine territory. Achish trusted David and said to himself, he has become so odious to his people, the Israelites, that he will be my servant forever. You may have noticed things are always about power. They were back then too, still are today. Don't ever forget that. Well, let's take a minute and pray. Father, again, I pray for Will. Bring grace and healing to him, Father. Uh, heal his stomach. Provide the right medical care for him. And Father, I pray that you'd continue speaking to us throughout this day. I pray that your word would settle in our hearts. Do write new things on our heart and change us from the inside out by the power of the Holy Spirit, according to the truth of your word. For I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. Have a great day.